Um, so we've been in a series called Senseless, and we've been talking about how God uses the tangible material world through our five senses to actually point us to deep spiritual truth, to help us connect to him and to what he's doing in our lives and around the world. So uh, I, I, have you ever actually, you don't have to raise your hand, but you know who you are. Have you ever taken a road trip just to eat, somebody, eat somewhere, right? Not somebody, but to eat somewhere. Or, or, or at least you were on a road trip and you went out of your way on that trip to go and eat at that place or get that thing that you were craving. So um, many of you know that know us, we always have a favorite Mexican place everywhere that we've ever lived. And one of our all time favorites was a restaurant in Petaluma, California when we lived there. And after, even after we moved out of the area, we'd still occasionally drive several hours to go and eat there just on a weekend. And it was always, it was always amazing. Now, I, I know you non-foodies, you won't understand this, but, but do you ever get like a craving for something? And so you decided like it was worth it to go and wait in that long line or to go to, to make that trip or to go somewhere just to have that very specific thing. And when you finally got it and you took that first bite, it was like the heavens opened and there were angelic choirs singing and it was incredible. Or, or how about this? Have you ever gone to the theater and you messed up the timing of your popcorn? Because there's a timing to it, right? Like if you get it too early and you're not really paying attention, by the time the preview start, it's gone. And you're just like, where did it go? I don't, I don't even remember eating it. It was just like going in my mouth and swallowing it. And, and, and you just have no idea. And that's why you got to get the refillable bucket, right? So you can go back and get more. Now, in our culture, we have a complicated relationship with food, right? We both obsess over it and, and to the point of like, we have whole like networks on television that are just devoted to food. And we watch baking competitions and cooking competitions and eating competitions. And like, all, like we're just obsessed with food in our culture. And, but we don't just uh, obsess over it. We agonize over it, right? Because as big as big food is, Big exercise is just as big, right? Like the, the whole industry of being healthy and losing weight and the whole thing. We have like all kinds of diets and it's this and non-fat that and take it, you know, gluten-free and joy-free and never enjoy eating ever again. So um, many of you know, we have a 14-year-old named Kai and we adopted him from China when he was three years old. And when he came home from China, he was obsessed with me being fat because he'd never seen anybody in his life overweight before. And so of course we taught him that it wasn't, I mean, he didn't know English at the time, but as he was learning English, of course we taught him it's not nice like to tell people fat or to like talk to him about how fat they are, especially when they're your dad, you know, uh, but, and, and so one day he came to me and he was just like five years old and he's like, dad, did you know you're really chubby? <laughs> And then he asked me two questions I wasn't prefer, prepared for. He said, how did that happen? Was it the food? <laughs> and he was genuinely asking, but I was not prepared for that level of condescension and judgment from a five-year-old. Because the truth is it was the food. It turns out there are a lot of things in our life that are because of the food. It's just a huge part of our life and we're drawn to the things that we're drawn to because of their taste. Taste is an intricate part of our everyday life. I mean, when you're tired or you're stressed or sad or worried, one of the key ideas that your brain comes up with is, you know what would taste good right about now and make you feel better, right? And it happens so much, we gave it a name. It's comfort food, which is code for, it's not good for you, but it tastes good to you. I mean, if you go to Costco and don't have at least one sample, did you even go to Costco? I don't know what your vacations feel like, but my, our vacations often feel like we're just out eating someplace we've never been before. Why don't we eat something and then, you know, afterwards we'll go and get something to eat. Like that's what vacation feels like. Or have you ever been eating a meal and realized that the entire conversation that you're having during that meal is just planning for where you're gonna go and what you're gonna eat at your next meal? Isn't that like wild? Like, I know we're having lunch, but what are we gonna do for dinner? <clears throat> ever picked up the wrong cup and taken a drink? You thought you were taking a giant drink of your Diet Coke, which is glorious, but it was somebody else's like iced tea or juice or some weirdo's like boba kombucha health drink thing weirdo and it's just gross and you're surprised, right? <laughs> or you ever just felt like you could taste something just by looking at it or hearing somebody describe it to you? Like, like, like these tacos? 
don't they? Oh, can't you just taste those? Eating is such a powerful experience because it affects and involves all five of our senses. I mean, if you've been here during this series, there may have been one of the previous Sundays where we were talking about one of the other senses and it's like, I mean, what does that any of this have to do with God? But have you ever tasted something so good it felt like a spiritual experience, right? Where you're like, there must be a God if something tastes this good, whether it's pizza or steak or fries or pecan pie or whatever your thing is. You're not gonna hear anything I say if I keep talking about food. You're just gonna be thinking about lunch. We even use language like heavenly or divine to describe food. What's interesting is so much taste depends on like where and how you grew up, right? Like I can't imagine how it's even possible that there's someone out there who doesn't just absolutely love fried chicken, but I married that person. (laughs) And then there's the cultural stuff, right? Right, in addition to different tastes and flavors and dishes and every society has rules around food of what you can and cannot eat. And it's always, always, always been that way. There's actually quite a bit of that in the Bible. So in the Old Testament, in a book called Deuteronomy, which is near the beginning, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, God is, in, in this book, God's giving a lot of commands and rules and instructions for how society, how he wants his people to operate. And so the, in Deuteronomy 14, it might be surprising to you, but there's a long list of things that God says not to eat when he's speaking to the Jewish people. And it's things like camels and rabbits and pigs. It's any marine animal that doesn't have fins and scales. There's a long list of like birds that you shouldn't eat. Thankfully, turkey's not on there. Any animal that died of natural causes, which just kind of makes me laugh, like it's got to be unnatural for us to be able to eat this. And then of course, right at the end of this list, it is absolutely forbidden to boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And so if any of you get up right now and have to run home (laughs) to take that goat out of that mother's milk. So these, these were all laws and practices that were given specifically to the Jewish people. But there are also plenty of other references in all, all over scripture that involve taste, that, that point to principles and wisdom and truth that applies to us all. In, in Proverbs chapter 25, it says that if you eat too much honey, it'll make you sick and you'll vomit. I don't eat lots of honey, but I do love candy corn. And this week I had entirely too much and I was very close to the truth in this story, in this verse. In Proverbs 23, it says red wine goes down smooth but too much of it bites like a snake. Some of you got a little bite marks this morning <laughs> that you're recovering from. Proverbs 17 says, better just to have a dry crust of bread and eat in peace than a feast that's full of conflict. In Proverbs 15, it says, broccoli and kale with your boo is better than a steak with your ex. Okay, I kind of like embellished that one a little bit, but that's the basic idea. In Proverbs 27, it says, you might pass on dessert when you're full, Clearly, this guy's not American, all right? But if you're hungry enough, even bitter food tastes good. And so much of what's said in these Proverbs is obviously true in just practical ways, right? It's true just about food. But what's interesting to me is all of the other ways that these things, these truths are actually true. Because as we've said all month, when you read the scriptures, there's always more going on than just what's on the surface, But it's also bigger than just the Proverbs, right? There are commands about feasting and commands about fasting. Psalm 119 describes the word of the Lord as sweet. In Psalm 34, eight, it's one of the most famous verses about taste in the Bible. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. What an incredible picture and invitation from God. Food was even at the center of the opening scene at the beginning of our story. You may know that story, but in Genesis, God creates humanity and he places them in a paradise and he gives them almost unlimited options and freedom. But there is one fruit from one tree that he commands them not to eat or even touch. And I don't like spoiler alert. I don't want to like ruin the story for you, but we kind of blew that one. But I want you to see what's actually said in Genesis chapter three, verse six, when this unfolds. It says that the woman saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit, its fruit looked delicious and she wanted it and she wanted the wisdom that it would give to her. And so she took some of that fruit and she ate it and then she gave it to her husband and he ate it too. Now, we don't have time to get into all this today, but one of the truths of this story 
And certainly one of the inescapable themes throughout the scriptures is this, is that your response to your appetites will determine the quality and direction of your life. Just on a practical level, whether you believe in God or not, whether you're a person of faith or not, your response to your appetites will determine the quality and the direction of your life, which is why you gotta be careful what you consume in your life because you can develop an appetite for almost anything. And those appetites can ultimately damage your relationships and derail your faith and destroy your life. By the way, it, it's really amazing to me that the only reason that something could look delicious to Eve is because of God's love and goodness for us, because he actually created us with the capacity to enjoy eating. That he could have made eating just a strictly utilitarian act, just a way to, to like, put fuel in the machine of your body, just like all the other animals, just like the rest of nature. But he didn't do that. Instead, he wanted us to enjoy it. He wanted us to get pleasure from it. He made yummy and delicious possible. And he made eating, he made food, he made taste, this communal, relational experience. Because you know, when you're with people you love, the food somehow tastes better. By the way, everything we've talked about so far is just in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there are a ton of Jesus's stories and lessons and, and miracles that take place around taste and food. He fed people a couple different times, thousands of people with just a, a few loaves of bread and fish. He turned water into wine. That was his very first miracle. He talked all the time about yeast and bread and what that has to do with religion and faith. One of the things the religious people hated about Jesus was that he was always feasting at parties. But then there's this, also the this story in John chapter four where he stops with his disciples while they're on a journey and they stop in a town at a well to get a drink of water. And, and the disciples leave to go grab lunch and while they're gone, Jesus has a conversation with a lady that absolutely changes her life. We don't know her name, she's just known as the woman at the well. And when the disciples get back, it tells us that Jesus isn't hungry because he's full from everything that had just happened in his conversation with this woman. And so the disciples are confused because they brought him lunch. And they're like, who, who, brought Je who fed Jesus? And Jesus says this in John 4, 32. He says, I have food that you don't know anything about. What an interesting thing for him to say. So I, I wanna take you to one of my favorite stories in scripture that's about food, that's not really about food, except it is, but not really. You'll see what I mean. It's in Acts chapter 10, and we're introduced in this chapter to a Roman officer named Cornelius. And Cornelius loved God, but he didn't know anything about Jesus. And so he's praying one day, and an angel appears to him and tells him to send some of his men to go and find Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, and to bring him back so that Peter can tell them all about Jesus. And so he does. And that's where we're gonna pick up the story. It's in Acts chapter 10, beginning with verse nine. It says, the next day as Cornelius's messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the roof to pray and it was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. We're gonna stop there for a second. You ever been in a hunger trance, <laughs> right? And, and then you of course have a deep spiritual experience that changes the course of Christian history which is what is gonna to happen to, okay, maybe not that part, but that's what happened to Peter. So he was really, really hungry and he has a vision about food and about God's love. See, God will always lead us to see beyond our own wants, beyond our own desires, beyond our own hunger, beyond our own appetites, beyond our own needs. And so in this story, he's, he's about to use a moment of physical hunger to prepare Peter to help people who were spiritually hungry. And so it continues in verse 11. It says, Peter saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles and birds. In short, all the animals in Deuteronomy 14 that he was told not to eat, that the Jewish people were told not to eat. And a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, this isn't a really big deal to us, but to Peter and to anybody else who would have heard this story, they would have felt immediate and overwhelming resistance 
to this voice telling them to get up and eat. See, because they knew all of those verses from Deuteronomy that I talked about. Because they, they, did, they just weren't taught them, they had memorized them. If you grew up as a child in a Jewish culture, you memorized the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. So they had them on lockdown. They knew exactly. There was no gray area. To us, they're just kind of weird religious dietary restrictions. But to them, they were literally the laws that they lived by. And they weren't just any laws. They were God's laws. And there were consequences for breaking them. And so Peter is hungry and he slips into a trance and he has a vision about food and he hears a voice that's basically like, yeah, all that stuff you've been taught your whole life not to eat, never mind that, go ahead and eat it. And God's like, just wait until you taste bacon, Peter. Check out how Peter responds, verse 14. No, Lord, Peter declared. He didn't just say it. No, God, I'm not doing that. I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. So just to make sure you're tracking with the story, Peter hears a voice that tells him to do something. He identifies that voice as God's voice. And his response to God's voice saying, arise, kill, and eat is, sorry, God, ain't going to happen. That's against your laws. And God's like, okay, but hear me out. I'm God. So Peter's basically like, God, what you're asking me to do is against my religion. And yes, we're absolutely supposed to pick up on the irony and the audacity and the absurdity of what Peter is arguing with God. Because he's arguing with God about what God is like. See, here's the thing. I, especially in churches and experiences that I grew up in, like religion, everybody's down on religion. And I understand why. But religion was meant to just be a set of rhythms and rituals and rules that were designed to facilitate and maintain healthy relationships with God and each other. And when they play that role and when they serve that function, everything's good, but it's easily polluted. The relationship is the point, not the rules, not the rhythms, not the rituals. And the moment that keeping to the rituals or holding to the rules replaces the relationship, that's when we've lost the plot, right? That's when religion is toxic. That's when it's gone bad. Because then we end up in a position where we're so self-righteous, we actually almost always will find ourselves fighting against God. And so when you read the New Testament over and over and over again, God's people, Jesus's followers are referred to as his body. See, Peter's vision wasn't just about what food that you put in your body. It was about what people God insists were part of his body. And so God's going, look, it, it includes more people than you think it does, Peter. It includes people that you might even think of as un clean. People that, that might not think like you or talk like you or God forbid vote, vote like you or act like you. See, God's heart is that his movement would actually be known, not for keeping certain people out, but for inviting every single human being alive in. And that includes people of your, and he's talking to, you know, Peter, and that includes people who believe just like you in your faith system. That includes people who agree with you, what your religion tells you. That includes people that, that, that your religion tells you to stay away from. That includes people who leave a bad taste in your mouth, Peter. That, that includes people that you find unpalatable. Verse 16 tells us that the same vision was repeated three times and then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven and Peter was very confused, very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Do you ever know what something means but you don't want it to mean what you know it means? I think that's what's happening here with Peter. Just then, crazy timing. The men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry for I have sent them. 
So God gives Peter the same vision three times. I, I, I'm so thankful that God is willing to repeat himself. Aren't you? See, the truth is, is that you can be sure that if there's something that God wants you to see or know or do, he will keep putting you in front of it. He will keep bring, bringing it right back around. And you can be like, I'm not, la, 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 I'm not paying it. It doesn't matter. He will keep repeating it till you hear it. And so this is the point in the story where the ultimate truth of what's happening starts to unfold. Because like in the story, the three men who just arrived, like their timing was impeccable. But do you know who they were? They were Gentiles. They were outsiders. They were pagans. They were sinners. To Peter, they were irreligious, unchurched, and unclean. They just happened to show up right after Peter's vision what a coincidence. So Peter ends up, remember the Holy Spirit said, go with them immediately. He doesn't. They tell, he's like, what do you want? They tell him, he's like, come on inside. Let's talk about it. You guys stay here. Let's sleep on it. And then he goes with them the next day. So he goes with these guys back to meet their boss, Cornelius. But it's not until he gets there that it's now starting to click. So Peter walks in in verse 28. And Peter tells them, you guys know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to even associate with people like you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of any of you as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. By the way, this is how, part of the, how you can know that the scriptures are, are being truthful in the stories they're telling because it's not whitewashed or watered down. Peter, who's... I mean, kind of the hero in the story. He's the perfect example of what not to do. He walks in and he's like, look, you guys know that you're dirty, rotten heathens. Let's just get that out of the way. You know that I'm better than you and I shouldn't even be here. It's against my religion to even come in your house. But lucky for you, God showed me that even though you're impure and unclean, I probably shouldn't think of you that way. And so I'm here. Now, what do you want? Even his description of what happened is off. He's like, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for, which is not even close to how it played out. What actually happened was that he argued with God. God had to show him the same thing three times. And then God had the time, the arrival of the three men perfectly to coincide with the conclusion of Peter's third vision. And even then when he met them, he's like, what do you guys want? What are you doing here? Leave me alone. In Peter's version of the story, he caught on instantly and obeyed God immediately. But in reality, he resisted from the beginning and eventually went reluctantly. Isn't it funny how we tend to like, the, how our version of events, the farther we get away, like we, we knew it all along. So easy to make ourselves the hero. But here's the point. Thankfully, either way, Peter got it. And it wasn't just good for Cornelius because when Peter's like, why did you guys send for me? Cornelius tells him, I had this vision. And Peter begins to immediately lay out who Jesus is. But it wasn't just good for Cornelius that he got it. It was good for us. Because if Peter didn't get this, as one, maybe the key leader after Jesus was gone, at least in this part of the story, we may not be here. I mean, the only reason truly that any of us, because we're all unclean like, to them. We're all Gentiles. We're all those dirty, rotten scoundrels. The only reason any of us are a part of the movement of Jesus is because of a lunchtime barbecue vision on the roof of a house that Peter had. We are the result of someone believing that God was, what God was doing included you and I. And so when he got to their house, he stayed with them and he spent time with them and he explained Jesus to them. And it actually, if you continue to read the story, it, it goes out of its way specifically to say that he ate with them multiple times, which was such a huge deal. So much so, and you can go read it for yourself, that when he left there and went back to all the other disciples, they jammed him up about it. Like, dude, what are you doing? Eating with people you shouldn't be eating with. But it's no wonder that he did it because Jesus, he'd seen Jesus do that over and over and over and over and over again. In fact, when you follow Jesus through the gospels, 
you can't help but feel like he believed that one of the best ways to show love was to sit down and share a meal with somebody. That there's a connection and an intimacy with, to eating with other people. If you were to think about your home, your, your house, like if your home were a body, the table is the heart. Because we don't come to the table to fight or to prove or to conquer. We're not there to defend or draw lines in the sand or stir up trouble. We come to the table because we have a need, because we're hungry. And just coming to the table is this unspoken admission of our own frailty and our own humanity. Because it doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how strong you are mentally or emotionally. You cannot grind your way through hunger. Eventually, you will break down and have to come and feed your body. Coming to the table levels the playing field because no matter who you are, no matter who you pretend to be, no matter what you've accomplished, you actually have to stop and allow somebody else to meet your need. Food is the starting point, the common ground. It's the currency that we offer one another in relationship. The table is where we slow down. It's where we can rest and laugh and breathe easy. It's one of the ways that we actually demonstrate and show love to one another when we share a meal. Sharing meals is how outsiders become insiders. It's how strangers become friends. And it's how friends start to feel like family. And in my view, and I certainly think in Peter's view, and far be it for me to talk, to speak for Jesus, but when you read the story of his life, I think it tells us that the table is one of the most sacred places that we could gather. It makes food and eating and tasting so much more than just something that we do to satisfy a craving or feed our bodies, that there's something deeper and more profound that's going on. And so I, I want to challenge you this week to an eating challenge. <laughs> Only it's not about how much or how fast. And it's not even about what. But it's about who. And it's about how. That that challenge would be that you would take time on just one day this week to slow down. To savor both the food and the people that are in front of you. Because look... You're busy, you got jobs and responsibilities and kids and in-laws and drop off and dishes and laundry and you got deadlines and parties. And I mean, it's just overwhelming, right? And so most of us just sort of eat on the go. We rush through our meals. We eat, but we barely even taste what we're eating. And the same is true in our lives. We're busy and rushed and hurried. We speed through our schedules. We speed through our days so fast. We barely see the people we're with, much less actually experience them. But in an intentional meal where you can sit down, have one of those meals and sit and savor so you can change all of that. Just break up that rhythm in your life to slow down and to have a meal with somebody. See, I, I'm convinced one of the most spiritual things that you can do is to actually eat with people and see them and listen to them and be as interested in them as Jesus is in you and as Jesus is in them. So one of the last things that Jesus did before he gave his life for us was he had a gathering with his friends and they shared the Passover meal. And as they were eating, he begins walking them through this imagery of what he's doing. And he says something really interesting because this conversation that he has with them really becomes the basis for why and how we celebrate communion. But Jesus, it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The apostle Paul writes, writes this in verse 23. He says, for what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And, and as I was reading that this week, I got hung up on that phrase, do this in remembrance of me. Do this 
in remembrance of me. What is the this? Well, certainly it's setting aside time as a faith community to, and, and even as individuals to reflect on and experience the power and the beauty of his sacrifice for us when it comes to communion. But what if it's also more than that? What, what if it's also just the meal itself? What if the do this is about slowing down and savoring both the food and the people in your life? People that you're close to and who are easy to love, like a lot of the men sitting around that table, or people who had also hurt you and betrayed you, who are also a couple of the men sitting around that table. But Jesus invited them to the table nonetheless and shared his final meal with them. I don't think it's incidental that Paul says, what I received from the Lord, I'm also giving to you. That we've sat down, that we've shared a meal, that I've, like, we, we've actually done this moment together. That I'm not just telling you about this. We did this when I was there. What if this, the do this, what, what if it wasn't just about remembering and celebrating Jesus, allowing himself to be broken and poured out for the world, but what if it's an invitation from him for us to join him and do the same in our lives, for us to allow our lives to be broken and poured out for the good of the world around us. See, the truth is we don't take communion, we receive it. Taking is what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. The tree was about taking. The table is about receiving. Taking broke us. Taking broke the world, but receiving is what has the power to begin to heal it and put it all back together again. Receiving what God has done for us and then doing that, what we've received from him, passing on to the people in our life. And so that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna end our service by celebrating and receiving communion together. We're gonna do this and we're gonna remember. Would you pray with me? South Hills Church, I just wanna take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and Abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.